If you take a trip down to where the Mississippi sheds its water into the Gulf of Mexico, you're going to find a lot of dead fish. Or more specifically, a vast strip of ocean that is virtually uninhabitable. This swath of water is ominously called the dead zone and is caused by reduced oxygen levels in the water, a condition known as hypoxia. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has been tracking its size and growth since 1985. This particular dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is the result of excess nutrients, specifically phosphorus and nitrogen, in the water. This excess causes a massive seasonal spike in algae populations, which then die off, sink to the bottom, and decompose. It's during this process of decomposition when the water's oxygen levels plummet, ultimately leaving coastal areas akin to a graveyard. Despite being a seasonal phenomenon, this decomposition of algae has changed the composition of the coastal habitats of Louisiana, Mississippi, and parts of Texas. And in August of this year, it reached a record size of 8,776 square miles, which is roughly the size of New Jersey. As the aquatic life in these coastal waters dwindle, the livelihoods built around a thriving fish population are also affected. Biggest dead zone in history in the U.S., and that is difficult news for the fishermen who provide 40% of this nation's seafood. But the dead zone is a product of our industrialized agricultural system, in which synthetic chemicals are injected into soil in order to spur growth on a dying land. As rain flows over thousands of industrialized farms in the Mississippi River Basin, it draws the chemical fertilizers into waterways, which eventually coalesce at the mouth of the Mississippi. So a conversation about the dead zone is truly about our widespread and often unchecked use of synthetic fertilizer to encourage consistent plant growth. Two of the main nutrient fertilizers conventional farms use are phosphorus and nitrogen. Phosphorus helps with root growth and plant strength, while nitrogen aids in the plant's ability to store energy via photosynthesis. In healthy soil, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, also known in the agricultural community as MPK, are generally plentiful. But due to excessive tilling practices and high rates of overuse and monocropping, the nutrient levels of conventional farms are ominously low. Thus, chemical fertilizer on large-scale crop fields are not a choice, but rather a necessity to consistently grow plants. And when applied en masse to a field of corn, the plants only soak up a portion of the nutrients. The rest sink into soil and often seep into nearby waterways. In 2016, the U.S. Geological Survey reported that around 1.15 million metric tons of nitrogen pollution flowed into the Gulf of Mexico, which is almost double the volume of oil that leaked into the Gulf as a result of the BP oil spill. Alongside this industrial crop production, the meat industry is also frequently blamed for the increase in algal blooms in the Gulf of Mexico. Indeed, corn and soybean production is often used for animal feed, which means that a decrease in meat consumption would mean a decrease in those two nutrient-intensive plants. But the algal blooms in the dead zone can also be tied to livestock corporations like Tyson by way of animal manure pollution which is generally rich in nitrogen. According to the EPA's toxic release inventory, the top five meat corporations dumped over 250 million pounds of toxic pollutants into waterways between 2010 and 2014. This has not only caused algal blooms in the Gulf of Mexico, but also events such as the Toledo algal bloom in 2014, which left over 500,000 residents without safe drinking water for days. In a way, we are choosing the short-term success of fertilizers and our desire for meat over both a fish population that supports many fisheries along the Gulf Coast and clean, healthy drinking water for thousands of communities around the United States. There are solutions to this problem, such as creating buffer zones between fields and waterways or reducing excess fertilizer use via education and enforcement. But as the environmental news outlet Grist rightly points out, blanket top-down regulations only go so far in halting waterway pollution due to the nuanced location-based issues farmers face every day. 
So in addition to regulatory backstops, we also need food distributors and buyers to establish sustainable practices, not just as a added bonus, but a business norm. This ultimately means that what we choose to eat shapes how we farm and influences our waterways and the animals that are so reliant on unpolluted habitats. This video was made possible in part by the wonderful people who support me on Patreon. If you're interested in helping me grow this channel, head on over to Patreon and pledge a small amount of money for every video I release. In return, I'll send you gifts like a handwritten thank you note or an Our Changing Climate sticker. As always, if you like what you just saw, share it around and subscribe. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next Friday.